You're having paranoid delusions. Hey, this is Ken J from Static X, and you are listening to the Metal Teddy Bear Experience. And welcome back to the Metal Teddy Bear Experience here at 90.3 WMSC of Montclair. This is your host, Chris. I have a special guest on the line. I have Ken J, the drummer of Static X. What's up, man? How you been doing? Hey, I'm doing fine, man. How's everything going out there? Um, it's been pretty good. Smooth day for me. It actually, it kind of looks like it might rain. Uh, we're based out of New Jersey. Um, where are you calling from right now? I am calling from uh, East Central Illinois, right on the Illinois-Indiana border, outside of, uh, pretty close to Champaign, Urbana. Oh, okay, nice. Nice, nice. I always hear good things about Illinois, so especially for hockey-related, too. Uh, a lot of hockey love there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, I am almost exactly in between Chicago and St. Louis, and, you know, you've got that rivalry, and, and uh not, too far away from Detroit, and so, yeah, there's a lot of hockey that that goes on. Still primarily football and basketball uh, sports places, but I'm also, you know, I'm an hour and a half away from Indianapolis, and I'm a pretty big racing fan, so. Hey, you got everything there. Absolutely. <laughs> pretty much. That is awesome. But um, I'm glad to have you on the show because uh, I know recently you guys in Static X put out a brand new record, which is crazy. Um, it's been so long. I think 2014. Um, Project Regeneration Volume 1. And this was uh, really dedicated to Wayne Static, the former singer. Um, how much fun was it working on this album? It was, you know, we were a weird band. I mean, with the, the three original guys would tell you and and for us to record again it's been since death trip in itself that the three of us have actually recorded i mean the the original lineup did death trip there's quite a bit of koichi's keyboards and programming on machine um but he was out of the band when we recorded that and um the thing is, is why we're weird is because all the work and and studio work is work, and it's it's especially physical for drummers. But because of what you're doing and the feeling you're getting from the songs and and everything, and you know, working uh, with Ulrich, um, it just it was it's fun. It's fun. It was an amazing experience. Everything has been an amazing experience. The tour was overwhelming. And um, so, yeah, it's it's a different experience than it used to be. You know, you used to put a team together and, and you know, we were, we were on Warner Brothers, but it was kind of like an, in, we were signed like an independent band. But now it's 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 a lot more DIY. You still put a team together, but it's it's people you're familiar with, and so. Um, but yeah, the the experience is amazing. I've been out of the business for 15 years, something like that. So uh, you know, everything's new to me again, and, and uh, I love it. Why'd you step away for 15 years? Well, I, you know. Um, we toured so much after Death Trip and Machine came out and didn't really take time off from each other. And even though, I mean, we're unusually close. We're more, we're much more like brothers. Our families know each other, even though we're from, you know, Koichi's from Osaka, Japan. And, and granted, we don't know his family as well, but, but, um, you know, our, our families are familiar with each other and we're always a part of the band and, and it kind of makes us more like brothers. But if you tour as much as we did um, those first five to six years, I mean, you're, you're basically in a, you know, rolling apartment building, or not even an apartment building, a two bedroom apartment, essentially, uh, you know, in a bus. Um, relationships get strained. Um, so that was, you know, what led to my leaving in the first place. And then I tried a couple other projects after Static X and, 
and um, I was forcing it. And I also got to a point where I thought that I just didn't need to be Ken J. You know, I just needed to be get back to to being a, I don't want to say a normal human being. That's uh-huh. really awful way to put it. You know, but just to you know, I like. I'm remodeling a house now, and and uh, uh, so you know, so I'm doing a little construction work and some landscaping, and and uh, um, you know, I've done some other construction work for friends and neighbors, and and uh, I like that stuff, and it allowed me, you know, being in a rock band and a successful rock band was was an unusual thing, and it's. It can be a traumatic experience, I guess. I mean, and uh, not complaining about it, but it's it's just a little unusual, you know. No, I totally understand that. That's a totally uh, justified answer. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a weird thing, and I, I am certainly not complaining about it. I mean, it, it is truly an amazing thing to do, but it it was nice to do, you know, that kind of physical labor and. You know, none of that stuff, you know, if you're shoving 50-pound rocks around or knocking out chimneys or roofing a house, none of that stuff cares if you're a rock star, you know? <laughs> so so it, that that's kind of nice, isn't it? And it brought back a balance to my life and, and uh, you know... Um, and then, I mean, musically, I, I had tried a couple of projects and, and produced some things I did during that time, you know, invest in a home recording setup, and, you know, I've been working with that. But then for for quite a while, I've actually been a drum teacher, and um, that was really a huge help as it appreciate it made me appreciate playing again and I, I kind of fell in love with playing drums again and the artistry of it and studying it and you know the teaching is uh, it, it's just such a wonderful thing and I really enjoyed that uh, quite a bit too but but yeah that all it in its weird way kind of brought me back to this now you know which is it, it felt perfect and it the timing was right for me to come back you know did you ever see yourself uh rejoining this this, this world, world this metal world, world and being part of static x again um you know i koichi and tony and i have talked about this and koichi was the first one to state in an interview that you know he had hoped while wayne was alive that you know, he felt that there was a chance, and I guess deep down, yeah, I, you know, we, I, th- I believe we all hoped that that would happen, um, you know, the last year to two years of Wayne's life, you know, there were, it, it was a rough thing to take in, obviously, you could tell something was wrong there, you know. Um, and then when he died, you know, your your feelings or your hopes about that kind of get dashed. So, um, in a sense, you know, I believe we had moved on a little bit. Tony was, you know, Tony was out with Soulfly and Ministry and, you know, that guy plays with everybody and, and has earned the right to do that. And Koichi had other projects and uh, for me, you know, I hadn't thought about getting back in a band, but but prior to Wayne's death, we had all, in those two years before his death or, or so, we had gotten back in contact and just were checking up on each other. And um, um, then, you know, a, a couple of years after Wayne's di- Wayne died, then Tony sent me an email, and he's like, hey, check out this song, and it was Push It. And I listened to it, and I, I, I had just gotten off work, and I listened to it. And I'm like, why has he sending me this? I've heard <laughs> it. I'm familiar with it. Yeah. You know? Um, so I called him up. I'm like, yeah, you know, what's the deal? And he goes, 
that's our new lead singer. And he had found Zero, and they started talking, and Zero re-recorded Push It with his vocal. And, uh, you know, I got cold chills. It was, it was like, wow, okay, you know. And that was that was the beginning of it. That's crazy. That's a, I feel like that's a, a weird way to be um, introduced back into like the band, the world. You know what I mean? After just like slowly talking to these people again, and then you get to hear "Push It" again with a new singer. I feel like that's a really uh, interesting way to start it up again. Well, and it, it was. I think that was the thing. Is it hadn't been that long. It had been maybe within a week or two of him sending me that song where there were some jokes made. Hey, you know, the original lineup. And I, I think that Tony just, you know, he's played for these amazing bands and these bands that were very influential on Static X in, in prong and ministry. And, um, but Static X was, you know, he we built this together. You know, those those four original guys built this thing together. And Zero is a, a friend that, you know, goes back to those days and and he's very involved in the music industry and he, he's very DIY and and he's executive produced things and, and to put it bluntly he's you know, kind of a crazy person, but he also, you know, from it, from the friendship standpoint and the, the feeling like we're brothers and everything, he clicked right in with that. You know, it, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, initially I think it was somewhat of a business decision, but yeah, it's, it's very weird. It's very static X. <laughs> um, but, and then I think because of that and, and getting that email with that song in it, 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 that was instantaneously like, oh, well, uh, you know, this could work, you know. And, but some of the a major part of the process was, you know, the going out on tour was a very, healing experience for the really the four of us but you know especially the, the three original guys you know it was it was cathartic it was um we kind of put it out there that you know or at least I did where hey you know maybe there's no such thing as closure and we're never going to forget Wayne and, and we certainly miss him but Maybe we can take these people, you know, who want to see it on this journey with us. And um, in that in that mourning and kind of grief and everything you're going through, even though the time had passed, it was incredibly emotional for us. And um, I'd like to say, you know, we kind of, we rediscovered the joy of, of being in a band together and playing those songs and just how fun it is. And yeah, it, it's truly been an amazing experience. And um, I, 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 I don't know that I ever felt like it would be like <laughs> this again. And then, you know, the album coming out, it's just people are just kind of gravitating to this thing and, and, and it's amazing well you guys did really well in your first week of sales um for project regeneration volume one um what do you think is the song that you uh that you guys had so much fun on um working on in the studio all of them really because um you know i kind of challenged myself in, as a drummer and everything but i would also tell you and they've they're all unique in their own ways and it's you know when you're we kind of had to work backwards on the stuff that we had where we had demos from Wayne where we had especially the stuff that had a more 
actualized vocal on it, you know? Um, but for me, I think it, just because it's a song that kind of encapsulates Static X um, is Terminator Oscillator. That song is just, it's just fun, and it, it, it kind of, you know, it's got that throwback to Death Trip and Machine where it's, it's danceable, but it's got an edge. So, of course, we're like, well, let's, there's a double kick in it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it's just, you know, it, it's just got a bounce to it and a, a silliness, but it, it's got an edge, you know, it's aggressive. I was actually going to say that one, too. Um, that's probably the one that I go back to a lot. Um, I also really enjoy uh, Bring You Down. Uh, I think that was one of the singles, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the third. And and bring you notice Bring It Down's got a, a kind of a, a little bit of a, it sounds like fix to me, you know, the initial guitar parts, but it's, uh, I mean, it's just got some cool programming. It, 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 yeah. It's all fun. It's all fun. It's fun to do this again. And, you know, coming up, you know, hearing, just hearing it all come together you know, has, has been a blast. Now, I know a lot of these songs were like demos or hidden recordings and stuff that you guys had to like, you know, scrummage together. Is there um, a song or a demo that like a tape you found that you're like, man, I, I don't know how we're going to make this into a, a song or make it work. And then eventually you guys did get it to work. Did that happen? Yeah, to me, that would probably be... I would tell you the initial demos I heard, demo I heard of Accelerate was the one where it was like, okay, you know, I don't necessarily know for sure. And and this is the thing is in, you know, the, the history's been <laughs> rewritten a little bit. Everybody in this band back in the, the 90s it was really kind of a everybody kind of had a twofold job um, meaning I was the drummer but you know really for Death Trip and, and a large part of Machine um, I wrote lyrics and but you know Wayne was the one because Wayne played rhythm guitar and was the vocalist um, I just wrote out these this can, kind of frantic non-rhyming freeform poetry type stuff and so I would just give either pages of stuff or full notebooks to Wayne and he'd flip through and read it and he'd focus on you know a paragraph or two at a time and that would be a a body of a song. Now that being said, the basic idea when Wayne and I lived together at the time when we were writing what became Death Trip and and Wayne would he had an Alesis HR sixteen B drum machine. Really basic drum machine but, but really cool for that time. But we didn't have access to the technology we do now, you know. Yeah. So we like hand built these drum programs, samples and stuff out of, you know, VH tape, VHS tapes and cassettes and stuff, weird stuff that we found. And we would take that and the drum machine, and he had a Fostex 4 track, and he and I would sit down with some liquor and <laughs> just uh, <laughs> build these weird programs. And. Then you have Koichi in the band, whose primary primary job is guitarist, but he's also, you know, a classically trained pianist. He's a keyboardist and a programmer, and and so, and you know, Tony was the bass player. He had to worry about, you know, backing vocals, and so we all worked on our individual parts. But then there was this you were kind of forced to look at the overall picture too and, and figure out what worked. And we worked really well together with that. 
um, it was kind of the same thing where, you know, we had these snippets, but, the, but again, we had, you know, and you would have a, a rhythm guitar part and some basic drum programming. And there might be a Wayne vocal on it or not. And you, you know, everything else was, we knew what was Wayne. And so the stuff with the vocals, I mean, we were building that from the top down, you know, for us, which was really a strange thing, you know. Um, but, it, yeah, you know, it, I know, it, did I just give you, that? I am just babbling here. <laughs> No, 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 you're doing I'm fine. Answer. No, I appreciate it's an it. Usual process. Yeah, no, I like hearing about the uh, the difference. Like, because, you know, sometimes uh, you hear so many things about, like, oh, Wayne did everything in the band. And then you hear, like, well, no, Tony did mo- most of everything in the band. And, like, I never, I actually never knew that you uh, did all the lyrics, too. Well, not all the lyrics, but I didn't know anything about the lyrics and you handing him books. Like, to me, that's very informative. And uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, well, and that was the thing. It wasn't, we knew, you know, Wayne had the hair and he's the lead singer. (laughs) Guess guess what? People are going to focus on that, you know? So we were, and we knew that, you know, and that was a very, uh, I mean, the rest of the band just has to, you know, I had a, um, I had a drum student at one time that was like, you know, how do I, how do I, how do I get noticed in my band more? And he was talking about fills and doing stuff drum wise, and I said, well, sell your drum set and buy a microphone. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's the truth. That's really honest advice. Yeah, I mean, you have to realize that it's going to be that way, but you can, you can, you know, all your satisfaction comes in. The songwriting and, and um, you know, the way our songs were written and everything, we could expand on live a little bit and change things up slightly. And, you know, we did some different arrangements, stuff like that stuff was fun. And, and, and you know, we knew Wayne was going to be the, the visual aspect of the band, which is what, you know, with, with uh, Zero out there. But, um, yeah, there's a, a lot of stuff out there, but uh, to me, it's it's like now it's in the past. It it doesn't really need to be addressed. And I, I mean, I'm certainly not. You know, it it, it is what it is. And, um, but yeah, Wayne would when we would write back in the day, and and you know, picture a couple of guys sitting on their couch in an apartment in Los Angeles, and he's got the drum machine and his guitar. And I'm sitting there with a lyric book and a Sharpie, and we're just, I'm crossing out stuff, and I've got a thesaurus by my side. And we're working, he worked on rhythmic patterns, and he would, so while we were building the song, the, the basic body of the song, and certain programming stuff would get added later, you know, he was certainly with keyboards and Koichi, and, you know, once we had somewhat of an established rhythmic vocal pattern, then you would have Tony come in and, and you know, there would be backing vocal suggestions, but he, you know, thought about what he was going to do with that and how he would work back and forth with Wayne. And it, it was all heavily involved. I mean, it, it was, you know, and the unfortunate thing is, you know, because the relationship's fell apart, well, then, you know, then you started seeing the history rewritten a little bit. But it's, it, like I said, it's it's okay. There's, you know, um, I, and I've been like that for years, you know. I'm still honored that people even consider Death Trip. I mean, I'm shocked at how many people kind of came out of the woodwork and they're like, you know, talking about how much impact this album had on their lives because, you know, we're not, even 20 odd years later, we're not far enough removed from that stuff to think, oh yeah, you know, it's a great album. We knew exactly what we were doing. None <laughs> of the three would tell it, tell you, none of us three would tell you that at all. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it, it, 
it's always on those lists of like albums that like generational albums and stuff like that you know i feel like that was definitely a a huge boom in the scene with like industrial metal and all that stuff you know like i feel like that album was very influential to that time period well and it 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 definitely to me machine is much more of what you would call an industrial metal album it's got an edge we were not you know it's got a dark edge to it that Death Trip was much more bouncy, but, um, you know, we weren't exactly, we were still getting along at the time that we recorded Machine and and Ulrich was involved in everything, but it it was a hard process. I mean, Koichi had left the band and, you know, we didn't take any time off after almost three years of touring. Three years of touring straight and then going back into another album, that's nuts. It was absolutely well, and that was, the, you know, the initial plan was, well, you know, I told these guys at the end of the tour, two months, I don't want to hear you from you guys, I love you, <laughs> going back to Illinois, um, I lived in Los Angeles at the time, and, um, and we all agreed to that, and then, you know, and I came back to Illinois, I actually took a four-day train ride home just so I could sleep, you know. Wow. And uh, I got back to Illinois, and I was home for 10 days, and I, I got the call from Wayne where he's like, Warner Brothers wants the next album. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay. You know, and then two, three days later, I flew back to Los Angeles, you know. And, um, and that was, you know, the, the reality is, you know, there there used to be an old saying where, and it's done differently now, you know. But the when you were signed to a major label back in the day, is you get your whole life to write the first album and eighteen months to write the second one. Well, we got like three months <laughs> to write the second one, you know. Yeah. Um. So and and you know, I think that. Looking back on it, you know there was there was a lot of pressure, and, but the other thing is we didn't necessarily argue with the label at all because the fact of the matter is you want to keep things going, you know. Yeah, you don't want to upset them. Yeah, and and plus, I mean, it was you know we what was our fault was that we could have said no to some of the tours that we did and just just would have changed how things. Are today, which is, you know, we're, I'm extremely grateful to be around Tony and Koichi again, and I, I missed them a lot. You know, they're they're like my brothers. I mean, it's a, we have a, a really great relationship. And you guys are working on uh, volume two, right? Uh, Tony was in. Uh, he did an interview recently where he said that you guys are working on volume two. Yeah. Yeah, there's some work being done with that. There were also there were also some things that we recorded that didn't go on volume one. Um, and there's some more work to be done on it. Um, but the reality is, you know, because of the coronavirus, um, you know, we were going to do limited touring this year, and there were going to be some set changes by necessity we you know we were not only memorializing Wayne but we were doing the, the tribute the death trip uh, uh, tribute you know the 20 years of, of death trip and so by necessity this being a new year and everything we were going to change up the set and look into even more back catalog and see what we could do with some of the project regeneration stuff and with touring being shut down, it's kind of that all went by the wayside. Yeah. Sadly. So, yeah. So, um, and with this album just coming coming out, you know, it's. Uh, I, I guess we get to sit around and let it stew a little bit and see where, you know, where we can take volume two, you know. Yeah, well, I, there's just so many things online um, 
talking about like volume two there a lot of people were saying that um there there wasn't enough uh demos or something or enough material for volume two so you guys were thinking about getting some guest appearances that were going to be on volume one i heard there's uh legal issues with um the former guitarist trip uh and then the coronavirus too like all delaying volume two so that's why i thought i'd ask it's I would just tell you the best thing to think about that is really, you know, the coronavirus and it has just, it's turned everybody into a, you know, we're in this moment, what can we do type thing, you know, in regards to bands. Um, for us, you know, we played a show a couple of weeks ago in Ringle, Wisconsin, and it was under coronavirus restrictions um, uh, Tony and Zero I mean yeah Zero's got a mask on but it doesn't cover his mouth but you know we the stage was cleared other than people we've been in direct contact with um, uh, Koichi and I wore masks you know they only did it was a 10,000 seat venue outdoors and they only sold 20% of the tickets there was and the, the whole idea behind that was, you know, regardless of what is going on with the coronavirus, politically, anything like that, regardless of what is going on, the one thing I've always disagreed with is the lockdown aspect, because that is just not good for anybody's mental health. Um, and that was the reason to try to play the show was, hey, you know, we've got to try this. Other bands need to try it. It's got to be under restrictions, but it's outdoors. And it's hot right now. We, that's one thing we do know is, you know, apparently this virus doesn't survive well in the heat at all. Um, and maybe we can at least take a step forward. There's going to be mistakes. Everybody's got to make it, you know, not just the bands, but the, you know, the promoters, the venues, everything. But um, it's just, you know, music, music is such a, and especially rock, any, live music is where it's at, you know, it's visceral and it's communal and, and it's just, there's nothing like it. So, um, that felt like an important first step and it it wasn't you know we didn't play anything off project regeneration we didn't I think we'd only played one show no we played two we played in green bay and milwaukee on the last tour but it was an opportunity to you know play the some of the death trip stuff again and um um so effectively we did the same set list you know but we just had to try something, regardless of, you know, legal issues or, or anything else that was being put out there. You know, that, that's kind of where we're at as a band. Um, in regards to there being enough source material, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's... Let's just leave it at that. Project, project came out. The project one came out, and uh, that's where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. And the festival was the July Mini Fest, right? It used to be called the Herd Immunity Festival. That's the one you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. And and I get you know I it's look I I think the one thing in this is you know we just really felt and you know we knew people were going to be skeptical you know um and um so yeah i mean it, it was a challenge but there you know the the setup going into it and everything i mean we hope everybody's okay uh another positive is the county that ringle was in had had a lot of cases unfortunately they had one death um but 
you know, it seemed like an opportunity to look ahead. Realistically, you know, um, I think we as an industry, and, and this includes, you know, the radio guys and everybody, we've got to figure out what we're going to do when it starts turning cold outside because, you know, indoor shows are are going to be rough. I mean, it, it that may not happen this year. Yeah, I think uh, Destruction played uh, shows in Switzerland, I believe. Um, and apparently those went off uh, fairly well. But a lot of the times you don't know if anyone got uh, sick or infected until like months later. Yeah, yeah, there's still... I mean, and, and it was a challenge for us, you know. Um, all of our parents are elderly. I actually... You know, I lived with live with my parents because you know my my father he's in remission now. But you know, my father has cancer, and and my mother uh, has some health issues, and so I'm here to take care of them. And you know, I kind of I had to come back and quarantine for a few days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's I mean it's its own set of challenges, but if we you know mask up and use hand sanitizer and watch out for each other, maybe. Maybe we can take a step ahead. Destruction played shows that somebody else did. We did an interview with a DJ yesterday who's a drummer in a band, and his show, uh, his band has played some, uh, a couple of indoor shows. Um, and, you know, they did limited capacity and everything. And oh, what band was that? It was... Um, Oh, I can't remember. I did so many interviews yesterday. <laughs> it happens, right? Well, I'm assuming the the live shows was that the, one of the live shows. It went well. Uh, yeah, for us, everything went well. Again, it was it was outdoor. I think if it was an indoor thing, uh, I don't know. I I don't know that we would have done it. But you know, it was outdoors, out in the middle of a field, about things about. 15, 16 miles outside of uh, Wausau, Wisconsin. So um, it was it was really cool. It just it just felt good to be playing, playing again. again. Yeah. And I played in a mask. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how Slipknot does it. Yeah, right. Uh, that's what a lot of people were saying that like going to the grocery store for 20 minutes wearing your mask, and then there was a meme with like Slipknot all geared up. They're like they play for two hours straight. <laughs> This is so funny. I mean, you know, and for a long time they, you know, maintained anonymity so well, you know, which was which was pretty amazing. But there, and the thing is, is you know, I was just wearing like a neck gaiter type thing, and Koichi had an actual mask on. But you know, I'm kind of I'm further back from everybody. And, but uh, as I'm up there playing, I'm like, man. Jay Weinberg does this every night with a much harder mask to deal with than what I'm going through. I can make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those masks are like full, you know, covered. Your head is covered sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like straps and stuff. So ridiculous, but it's awesome. Um, so my other question for you guys is: uh, Is there is zero coming back on Volume Two? Okay. Yeah, I just I just wanted to make sure on that because, um, you got are you guys doing the guest appearances at all that you guys previously talked about or is that is that done? Um, I th- I believe that's done. Um, you know, the the reality is, you know, with the dis- discovery of these demos and the fact that you know Zero did so much on Volume One is and people have gravitated to it is, you know, now we absolutely know it's going to work. So, you know, probably be a mixture like that. But but that being said, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, having Al Jorgensen on on uh, Project Regeneration Body 1 was just such a huge treat. And the way that song turned out absolutely so well, it, it, it kind of it's got more of an edge and is more guitar driven than the stuff that the goth stuff that Wayne used to love but it does remind me that you know when I joined his band in 1988 in the 
fall of 88. You know, they were a goth band. They were, they were kind of like early cult. Wow. And um, I, it kind of grabbed me like that. And they said, I wanted to do that song really, you know, that's, that's a pretty special moment on that record. Oh, definitely. And uh, I'm pretty sure him and Tony uh, knew each other pretty well from Tony being in ministry, so that probably helped out. Hey, absolutely. Absolutely. Tony's got the most fun Al Jorgensen stories. And, uh, <laughs> we love hearing them. I've probably heard them all twice. I don't even care. I, I just tell me more. Um, you know, it's, it's like I said, uh, and <laughs> Wayne was more especially when I first met him later on he kind of the, the switch was flipped a little bit when, when I first met him he was not he, the only heavier right there were two bands that he liked that he and I it, it was common and uh, that was Kiss and um, Prom he loved uh Oh, the album before Beg to Differ, that was kind of like a punk album. We did like some punk bands, you know. Um, we liked uh, Circle Jerks and Black Flag. And, and nice. Yeah, there was there was that commonality, but um, as much as he affected me with the goth stuff, I affected him with the metal stuff, and I kind of even went further into goth and researched it, and he kind of went... You know, the other way, I mean, he ended up being like a fan of, you know, Obituary and Carcass and um, I Hate God. And, <laughs> a little more death metal, metal, yeah. Yeah, Crowbar. Like, he he loved death metal and sludge, you know, stuff kind of tuned down. And, and um, the weird thing was, you know, coming back to these commonalities and finding one word that but all of that it kind of ended up in Static X in a way, you know? Well, I'm going I'm gonna to segue into a nice little segment I like to call the uh, Three Random Silly Questions segment. Are you ready for this? I am, absolutely. I love this stuff. <laughs> okay, question number one is a nice, easy one. What is one of your favorite breakfast foods? I have to say Eggs Benedict. Okay, solid. solid. Don't have it often. Absolutely love it. <laughs> I'm uh, currently right now I've been really into French toast um, I was never really that into French toast but uh, lately I've been having it and it's been so good I like want it every day I wake up <laughs> here's a weird thing try it with uh, sourdough sometime it's sourdough weird. Okay. Yeah, it's a weird thing but uh, you know what I've never met a bread I didn't like, so I didn't like that. I watch it at my age. I don't eat that much bread. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, the French, and, you know, French toast, waffles, uh, pancakes, crepes, all of that stuff, I absolutely love it. But Eggs Benedict is the one where every once in a while I, I just I have to go find an IHOP and get their there's just something about it. I was actually interviewing a band last time we had the whole discussion about Denny's and IHOP and uh, the guy absolutely hated Denny's and IHOP and I, I just I, was, I just didn't understand how someone could hate IHOPs and Denny's that much. <laughs> well and, that, and that's the thing I mean you know breakfast food is such comfort food I'm kind of surprised that Eggs Benedict came out that easy but but um, and that's why I hop eggs Benedict is just it's consistent everywhere you get it and it's so good. Denny's, um, I love Denny's too, man. I mean, it's breakfast. <laughs> America's Diner, as my friend likes to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right, question number two. Uh, what's a, a fun or an unusual experience you had while touring in another country? I love all of that. Um, kind of a big reader of history um, so getting you know I'm the first member of my family that was non-military 
combat got to go overseas. And now my middle sister is a, a documentary filmmaker, and, and she uh, came to see the band in England on one of our first trips over, and just having family there and being in a foreign country was a cool thing. My oldest sister and uh, a younger sister actually came to Mexico City the first time we played. Those were those those were very playing in any fun foreign country is is fun. Um, I love going to all of them, you know, and just taking in the culture and history and seeing what it's about. The people are wonderful, but. Uh, those two moments, you know, are, are fairly special. Yeah, I would imagine so. I mean, I, I haven't actually left the uh, uh, continent. I've been to Canada, but I've never been to, uh, you know, Europe or anything like that. So that just, just sounds like fun. I, I would tell you, are you a fan of sushi at all? Actually, I'm not. I'm not a fan. <laughs> Well, and, and it kind of doesn't matter. If, um, I would tell you, you still Japan. Japan's one of those things where it just seems, and Australia is the same way. You just think to yourself, "Oh man, these flights are going to be so long." You yeah, know, fifteen hours, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and you know, Australia was. Man, on the way back from Australia last year, and that was my first time going there, I, the flight back was only 11, 11 and a half hours, you know, because you're in the slipstream and everything. And I got off the plane in Los Angeles, walked to the other end of the airport, and got on a flight back to Illinois, you know. So I was, I was basically on a plane for... And it, it was, I had a stop, too, in, in Salt Lake City. So I was basically on planes for over 20 hours. It was something like 22 hours. And, That's um, grueling. <laughs> it, that was absolutely grueling. But the whole time, just thinking about the trip to Australia was in just how much fun it was. Um, it, it just... I highly recommend Australia, Japan. They, yeah, they're long flights. Don't get me wrong. Um, and spend the money and make yourself comfortable on the flights. But it, it, it's just the food in those places is so good. You know, just everything about it. And the, the Japanese people are just, you know, wonderful people. I mean, everybody treats us well anyway, you know, but... But those, I recommend the flights. It's worth it. Yeah, I feel like I always want to go to Australia. Uh, also here in New Zealand is always nice. I feel like those are cool. But the only thing about Australia that freaks me out is that they said everything there can kill you. <laughs> and it's right around the corner. I saw a bat. And put, I mean, they have, what, quokka? Is that how you say it? Quokka? I have no idea. <laughs> the cutest animal on the face of the earth. It's spelled, and you'll you'll want to Google this. It's Q U O K K A. Adorable. Um, unfortunately, I caught a cold when I was on a, in Australia, so I my day off was spent, you know, trying to get over that. But our tour manager went, and so of course I have pictures of this adorable animal. Um, but yeah, the only other animal I saw in Australia was a bat, roughly like my size. <laughs> I mean, it, it flew around, I went, and and we were outside signing autographs, talking to a few people, and the bat flew overhead. And, you know, Tony's been there a few times, and Tony was like, "Oh yeah," and they, they said, "Well, they won't hurt you. They're they're actually kind of supposed to be really good pets." I'm like, "The <laughs> thing's like what six feet." That's crazy. <laughs> huge. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's nuts. It's freaky. Yeah, I was kind of freaked out about spiders and snakes. <laughs> well, I'm glad you came back okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, question number three. Uh, which celebrity should have their own candy bar, and what would it be called? Oh, good question. 
just to give you some ideas, uh, Tom Brady from the Patriots, or actually now uh, he's in Tampa. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the Brady Bunch Bar. <laughs> Brady Crunch. Sorry. Nice. Yeah, people saying the Brady Crunch. I don't know, I have a good answer for that. I would have thought, you know, being a kid that really grew up in the 70s, I would have thought there should have been an Evil Knievel candy bar. Oh. Uh. become, like, broken up into little pieces. <laughs> Yeah, right? That's actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They have to be crunchy, but broken up into little pieces. Yeah. yeah. What would you call that? I, oh, man, I got nothing. Yeah. I'm usually quicker than that, but, uh, yeah, I got nothing for you. That's a c- Congratulations. You win the Best Question Ever award. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, one person said I'm surprised Kanye doesn't have his own uh, candy bar yet, which is pretty good. Yeah. The West Bar. Yeah, he's got shoes. I mean, why would he in a clothing line? He should just have everything. What was that? Oh, the the, the Kanye West. I, I don't know. Kanye, um, doesn't he? He's kind of known for something, a uh, sheezy or something. I'm not that too well versed in Kanye, but I thought he had like a saying um, that he can use. Yeezy or. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> the Yeezy Bar. <laughs> You know what's going to happen. We're going to end this thing, and it's just going to be like, oh, I should have said this. Yeah, right? That always happens. But um, that was the Random Silly Question segment. Hope you enjoyed that. Absolutely. It was awesome. And uh, before I let you go, is there any upcoming plans for Static X? Are you guys uh, doing like a live stream show? A lot of bands have been doing that. Do you have any other uh, actual live performances planned? Uh, What's up next? Um, potentially, you know, we were, we were going to do limited touring this year. It was mostly going to be in Europe, Ukraine, and Russia. Um, pretty much, you know, everything there was going to be a festival. Ukraine and Russia were, were going to be, I think we're, uh, it's with Life of Agony. Um, nice. I think we are still doing that. That's going to be coming up late November, December. Um, other than that, um, I could not tell you. Um, <laughs> you know, there's truthful answer. Yeah, everything's just so up in the air, you know. But uh, apparently, um, Ukraine and Russia have dealt well with us. So, you know, hopefully, we'll get to go back over there. That was an amazing experience last year too. So. I bet, and uh, be, just being a fan right now, we, we hope to have you guys back soon. Um, uh, all touring back. It's been. I used to go to shows at least once or twice a week, you know. Um, and I've now gone to none in five months or something. It's crazy. <laughs> and it, it it affects you. I mean, all all joking aside, um, you're not the first one. I mean, it, everybody is so affected by it, and and. You know, just a, a concerts are just such a communal thing, and, and yeah, we gotta we gotta figure out a way to get through this to start trying stuff. Um, I have told people this, and and I certainly don't disagree with the live streaming thing at all. Um, I think. I would look more towards the drive-in thing than the live streaming thing, where people can stay in their cars. Um, just there's such a just the reaction, you know. It, it just that live reaction and having people there, and it, it just kind of drives you and pushes you on so much that you know uh, we all miss that. Um, not just the bands, but the, you know, the crowds and certainly the promoters, venues, you know, anybody, uh, all the concessions, all that stuff, you know, security. I think we need to, to you know, look out for each other and try to have some concerts somehow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you're never going to replace that feeling of actually going to a live show. 
with a you know live stream concert but if it's the closest thing we get right now i'll take it like some bands have been doing great trivium put on a, a great performance um i'm not a huge fan of dance gavin dance but i heard they put on a, a great performance as well fans have been loving it so it's interesting to see what uh what comes yeah yeah i would uh, you know and it's certainly just because uh you know we've we've got the album out and everything I, it's something we haven't really talked about a whole lot um you know we're more trying to figure out a way for for people to attend you know that's that's been what we've been discussing but but again you know we're up on stage and um you know so you know we know in that sense we're protected it's, it's you know we've got to make sure the crowds and everybody else are are protected and, um just try to figure out a way forward through that definitely but um ken thank you so much for joining the show this is a blast and um you know I can't wait to be uh, listening to Project Regeneration Volume Two. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's always my pleasure, really. I, I um, I'm a talker, as you can tell. So, um, and you know, since again, I'll say it again, since the lockdown thing, you know, I'm I'm really I work outside a lot, and and I'm kind of by myself and. And, uh, you know, my social socialization really, and I have friends, but the majority of my socialization is through touring. So getting to do interviews now, please accept my apologies for being late yesterday, but, you know, I realized, oh, I get to be social in this. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, it was kind of, I was energetic and talking a lot, and the people interviewing me were talking a lot. It just, uh, I think that's a, a good thing. I'm, I'm not a social media guy at all. Um, I get it. But, you know, physically talking to somebody, I like that a lot more. Oh, definitely. Uh, we've all been uh, starving for some sort of social event, social, you know, just talking to your friends and stuff like that. Zoom meetings, just hanging out with your friends online. So uh, I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah, it's interaction we're social beings <laughs> well thank you man uh, enjoy the rest of your night you got it you take care too it's great talking to you.